Hi, my name is Carrie Case and I'm going to be your facilitator for today's lecture. Today we're going to discuss misplaced modifiers. So we're going to talk a little bit about what misplaced modifiers are, how to identify them, and how to fix them. So let's get started. So the first thing is to talk about what modifiers are. And modifiers can be words, they can be phrases, they can be clauses, but remember that they typically act as modifiers. They're acting as adjectives or they're acting as adverbs. And so they're typically describing or modifying something in a sentence. So for instance here, the black cat. Black is our adjective here. It's our modifier. Here we have the cat in the corner. This is a prepositional phrase that's acting as an adjective telling us where the cat is. And then the cat that he adopted. Again, another descriptive phrase talking about the cat telling us which one. So sometimes modifiers limit another word to make the word or words more specific. So for instance, the basket in the boy's bedroom. So this is telling us again which basket. It's a phrase. It's a prepositional phrase. Notice it's not as simple as just an adjective or an adverb here. It is a phrase. And we make sure that it's talking about the basket. Here we've got 20 cookies telling us how many. We've got the card that she gave me. So if somebody said, which card? They might say, well, the card that she gave me. This is the adjectival phrase that tells us which card. And they seldom visit telling us how often. So seldom here is the modifier telling us how often, how often they visit. It is explaining and making words more specific so that we know exactly what our uh, writer is trying to say. Now, sometimes those modifiers are placed incorrectly in a sentence. And as they're placed incorrectly in a sentence, we need to not only be able to identify that they're placed incorrectly, but how to fix them. Now, the problem is, is as readers, we make a lot of assumptions. We spend a lot of time trying to figure out what our writers are trying to say. The best writers don't require that of our readers. The best writers make very clear exactly what they're trying to say, exactly what they're trying to discuss. That's your job as a writer. It's not their job as the reader to figure it out. So as the writer, you need to do this very well. As a reader, we shouldn't have to do that. So as readers, we typically do. We're surrounded by bad examples of writing every day. But as writers, we need to make sure we take that responsibility ourselves. So modifiers can make your writing more specific and more vivid. This is, is way more than, uh, you know, I love my cat. It might be, I love my big, fluffy, soft black cat. We want to make sure to add these modifiers to create this image for our readers. The more of an image that we create for our readers, the more likely you are to stay with us and to be engaged in what they're reading. And so as writers, we want to make this very clear. So as a result, modifiers typically give the reader a clear picture of what you want to say, and they help you to say it precisely. And if we're going to do this, we need to make sure to do it correctly. So as a rule, we typically put our modifier as close as possible to the word, phrase, or clause it's modifying. We need to buddy them up. They need to be holding hands the majority of the time. We want them touching each other in the sentence. If they are displaced or separated by phrases or structure or punctuation, then sometimes that causes a little bit of disruption in the understanding of our reader. So make sure the noun or pronoun in a sentence where we have a comma in the middle is usually doing what comes before the comma. We're going to talk more about this later, but as a rule, if we have a comma in the middle of a sentence, then typically what comes after that comma needs to be our subject our, or our doer of whatever's inside the comma phrase. We're going to talk more about this as we go, but just be aware as you're looking through some of these that, um, that commas uh, play a very important role and a very specific role. So we're going to look at three steps to help you check for sentence errors with modifiers, okay? And, and these are three very simple steps, um, but they, they will get you where you need to go. So the first thing you need to do in any sentence is you need to find your modifier. And this, can, remember, can be a word, it can be a phrase, it can be um, a piece of a sentence, it can be a lot of different things. You just have to be aware of what you're looking for. Then ask yourself, does it have anything to modify? And if it does, we need to decide, okay, well then is that modifier in the right place? Is it, is it as close as possible as it needs to be to the word, phrase, or clause it's modifying? And if it isn't, then we, of course, need to fix that. Okay, so we're going to use this method to look at an example, and we're going to fix the example as we go. 
So our first example is they were looking for a man walking with a dog smoking a cigar. Now this one is a very clear sentence and part of what makes this so clear is because this is a fairly simple sentence. When you're getting into your compound and complex sentences, the relationship of information may not be so clear to your reader. So understand that I'm, I'm starting you out with a very, very simple sentence to understand. But as you um, uh, increase your vocabulary, as you increase your sentence structure um, and, and explore academically, you're going to realize that this causes more and more problems because there's, there's more stuff in a sentence to jumble up your reader's understanding. So this is a very simple sentence. The thing is, and the secret, secret is, you have to look at it very literally. And that's the test. Look at it literally. And then picture it as you read from left to right. Our readers read from left to right. So they will form the picture in their head as they read from left to right. So if you read this sentence, it says they were looking for a man. So the looking for a man should be the first thing that you see in your, in your mind. Then he is walking a dog. Okay, so that you see a man and you now might see him walking through a park, walking a dog. And then you see that the dog is smoking a cigar. Now some of you just switched it to a bulldog for whatever reason. The dog's got a cigar hanging out of its mouth. Because if you read this from left to right, our modifying phrase is smoking a cigar. And it typically is going to attach to the nearest noun or pronoun before it. And you will realize that dog is the nearest noun or pronoun before smoking a cigar. So the way that this sentence looks like is this man is walking a dog through a park and the dog has a cigar in his mouth. Now most of you go, well, that's ridiculous. There wouldn't be a dog with a cigar in his mouth. Some of you may know people like that, but uh, not typically. And, and so because of that, most of you automatically put your modifier where it belonged and you read it correctly. Again, as your language expands, as your academic experience expands, there's more to put into a sentence and it's not so easily discernible. So, on that note, what is the modifier? So the modifier phrase here is, is we've actually got two, we've got walking a dog, this is our ING phrase, and we've got smoking a cigar. So we have to look at where the INGs need to go. So we know that the man is walking the dog, but who's smoking the cigar? And so because we're looking at who's smoking the cigar, we know that this one is, is probably misplaced because we now know that it needs to go as close as it can to the man. And we may need to play around with the sentence. And there's no absolute right or wrong answer. There's just often the clearest way to explain your, what you're trying to say. So take a second and write down what you think the sentence might look like if we fixed it and we move the smoking a cigar as close as we can to the man. Okay, so at this point, hopefully your revision looks something like this. They were looking for a man smoking a cigar and walking a dog. Notice that, again, the walking of the dog, we automatically attach to the man because it's an ING, but that AND helped us to balance that seesaw. So we now have two things that the man is doing. We could have said, we were looking for a man walking a dog and smoking a cigar. That would have worked. But a lot of times we're going to focus on the man before we focus on the dog. So because we're focusing on the man first, we probably want to attach the smoking of the cigar as close to the description of the man as possible because the dog is something else that he's doing. So in this case, there's no absolutely right or wrong answer. But putting the, the smoking of the cigars definitely to him uh, is probably one of the best ways to try to organize this sentence. Okay. Let's try another one. This one can be taken a little long, so just try to keep it clean, people. Okay, so slathered in whipped cream and nuts, she ate the hot fudge sundae. So remember that we talked a couple of slides ago about typically whatever comes after the comma is what should be doing what came before the comma. So after the comma is our subject, typically. And you will notice that it's she. She is doing the eating of the sundae. So she's the doer in the sentence. She's the subject of the sentence. And we began with a participial phrase, slathered in with cream and nuts. We're starting with that adjectival phrase, or adje yeah, adjectival phrase. So it's followed by a comma. It's a dependent clause, comma, independent clause, okay? So this uh, kind of looks a little silly because it looks like she is the one slathered in whipped cream and nuts. All right, which we know probably isn't correct. She wouldn't be in the middle of a, of a Sunday shop slathered in whipped cream and nuts. 
So again, we have to ask ourselves, what's the modifier? So we know now that our, our participial phrase is the modifying phrase here. And we have to decide, what is it trying to modify? Well, we now know that she's not the one that's slathered in whipped cream and nuts. So take a second and decide, what is slathered in whipped cream and nuts? OK, yeah, very good, the Sunday. All right, the Sunday. So we have to decide, is it in the right place? This one's very easy. This one's a dependent clause, independent clause. Uh, but there are two ways to fix this sentence. So we're going to look at both ways. So the first one is slathered in whipped cream and nuts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix the comma error, that whatever comes after the comma is what's doing what comes before the comma. So if I look in this, it's the hot fudge sundae that is slathered in the whipped cream and nuts. So I'm going to stay with the original sentence structure, and I'm going to just put my pieces where they need to go. So now it's slathered in whipped cream and nuts. The hot fudge sundae was eaten by her. So you'll notice that, again, that what came before the comma is attached to what's coming after the comma. But you will notice that this is in passive voice. And remember, we typically avoid passive voice whenever we can, unless we're design, deciding to specifically draw emphasis on our dependent clause that we're, we're leading with. And so we can make this active by going ahead and just switching the parts according to um, subordination. So the second example is, she ate the hot fudge sundae slathered in whipped cream and nuts. Um, we can add in a bunch of what like, that was, we can do all sorts of things. There's no exact right, right or wrong answer. But do notice that we do have a passive option and we have an active option, but they both fix that kind of perverted interpretation of our example. Uh, so notice that, again, you've got some people with some dirty minds, and if you're not very clear at what you're trying to say, then um, they, they can take it away from you, and you don't want to do that. Okay? So overall, what we've got to make sure of is that we're very clear what we're trying to say as writers. And, and remember that, that just because we understand it and because we might be very good at figuring out somebody else's mistakes doesn't mean that our reader is as talented as we are. So modifier problems can result in confusing or even silly sentences, and the reader will miss your point. So remember, again, to check for modifier problems. You've got to find the modifier, find out what it's supposed to be modifying, and put it in the right place. Now remember that you typically want to put the modifier as close as possible to what it's modifying. You want them buddies. You want them holding hands if possible. There's other ways to do it, but for the most part, uh, basic understanding of a sentence is to put it as close as possible to what it's trying to modify because it typically will attach to the nearest noun or pronoun in front of it. Um, and then if it doesn't have anything to modify, add or change the word, um, word so it does. And we're going we're gonna to discuss that in the next lecture. But be aware of where a modifier is and what it's supposed to be modifying and make sure that your sentences are constructed properly. Okay? Thank you very much. Hope you've enjoyed this entertaining lecture.